So it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, John Davies. John taught history and religious studies at Leeds Grammar School for many years. He then uh, became headmaster of the junior school. He then became headmaster of Moreland School. And then after retirement, he's moved back to what is now the grammar school at Leeds as their archivist. John, you may remember, last spoke to us in 2014 about his research into pupils at Leeds Grammar School, who were sadly killed uh, during the Great War. And this his research resulted in a book, A High Ideal, Leeds Grammar School and the Great War, that was published in 2016. This evening, John is going to talk to us about Field Marshal Lord Nicholson from LGS to CGS. So welcome, John, and over to you. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you uh, for inviting me back to, to speak to you again. Um, I've chosen William Gustavus Nicholson as, as the subject because uh, I'm researching him at present for a, a PhD at Leeds University, and uh, my research has been somewhat delayed uh, by two years because of the pandemic with archives and libraries being closed. Um, and I'd hoped to have finished it by now, but I haven't. Um, so, uh, as I said, the, um, the title of my talk is, uh, is from LGS to CGS. Uh, is that, is that shared property now, Peter? Can you, uh, Alan, can you see that? Fine. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, um, William Gustavus Nicholson is, a, is an interesting, compelling, controversial and largely forgotten character. Uh, he's mainly unknown amongst historians. He's born in Leeds and yet he uh, was virtually unknown in his native city. This is, this is he, uh, this is a portrait by a chap called George Hall Neal, it's in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, Nicholson is one of those uh, figures who is collectively known as the Forgotten Victorian. Yeah. Al although he wasn't actually uh, promoted a full general till 1906. Partly so little is known about him because he left no body of letters or other documents. There's no single archive of source material relating to him. So my research has carried me thus far from, uh, from Cornwall to Edinburgh to London to Oxford. Uh, very little about him in Leeds itself. Um, all these documents lie in other people's collections. There's also a tendency, I think, to, to focus on command in battle uh, rather than expertise in administration. Uh, and Nicholson was an army administrator uh, and as such has been largely ignored by historians. He's not a soldier in the, uh, in the truest sense of the word. He showed very little aptitude for fighting. He could have made a very successful career in the civil service or in the law. Uh, but for some reason, uh, and it's impossible to find out why, he chose instead to, to forge a career in the army. Um, he excelled in, uh, in administrative control. He was the leading staff officer of his day and one of the most remarkable soldiers of his generation. He is uh, widely recognised as being probably the most intelligent and able soldier of his time, um, while at the same time he gained a reputation for being a, a rather difficult person. And that last part has really arisen because uh, given the lack of uh, personal documents, his history has been written by other more prominent people uh, and more especially those with whom he didn't get on. Uh, people like Lord Kitchener, uh, Jackie Fisher, Lord, who became Lord Fisher, and Sir Ian Hamilton. Um, although his relationship with Hamilton is, uh, is interesting, as, uh, as will be explored later in this presentation. Nicholson spent most of his military career in, in India. Uh, he went there in, in 1871, uh, and he stayed there for most of the time until he came to the War Office in 1901. 
but he also served in Egypt and he served in, uh, in South Africa. Eventually, he became uh, the second chief of the general staff in 1908. Uh, and the, he was the first chief of the imperial general staff uh, when the post was, rede was redesignated in 1909 until he retired in 1912. <coughs> As such, Nicholson was involved in preparing the, uh, the army for its involvement in the Continental War. And it's impossible to fully understand the reorganization of the British Army or the development of British strategy prior to World War I without a knowledge of Nicholson's career. Just thinking about his early life, Nicholson was born here at the Mansion House in, in Round Hay on the 2nd of March, 1845. He was the, the fifth son of William Nicholson Nicholson and his wife, Martha. Uh, in total, they had 13 children. I haven't got the time to go into the, uh, the history of the Nicholson family, although it's, uh, it is quite an interesting history in itself. Um, the sons in particular, uh, pay uh, great uh, um, need need attention paid to them um, because they have a, a very interesting background and in some senses uh, William is is really the most normal of them all. Um, the family was uh, a landowning family but not particularly wealthy. Uh, his father William Nicholson Nicholson had uh, only inherited the estate in 1858 on the death of his uncle. Uh, and he'd had to change his surname from Phillips uh, in order to inherit the estate, hence the name William Nicholson Nicholson. Uh, and then it was sold in 1871 following his death, uh, which had occurred in 1868 due to problems of inheritance. Uh, Nicholson's father was a, a learned man. He had a master's degree from Cambridge. He was Lord Lieutenant of the West Riding of Yorkshire. And yet, despite his inheritance and his influence locally in an era when uh, a combination of money, position and connections mattered, he didn't have the influence or the family connections that would expedite his son's career. Nicholson went to Leeds Grammar School in 1857 and his time at the school coincided entirely with the headmastership of the great Reverend Dr. Alfred Barry, who arrived at the same time. And they both left the school in July, 1862. Barry to become uh, headmaster of Cheltenham College. And he then went out uh, eventually to, uh, to Australia and became the Bishop of Sydney and then the primate of all Australia. So he's a very influential figure uh, in both in, in religious terms and also in education because he established the independent school system in, in Australia. Um, so when he left the, to go there, Nicholson also left the school to enter the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. During his time there, Barry transformed the school. He transformed its curriculum. He moved the school to uh, the site on Woodhouse Moor in 1859. And there is no doubt that Nicholson excelled under his, uh, his leadership. There are very few records, unfortunately, um, and I've scoured the archives at school. There are very few records of Nicholson's time at the school. Although we do know that uh, his main contribution to life at the school was the introduction of the officer training corps. This he started on his own initiative. He had no help from any of the staff but Barry gave him free reign to do so. Nicholson designed the uniform, he organised the drills, he uh, was the one who organised the meetings of the Corps. Uh, he had it linked, uh, established links to the Leeds Rifles. Nicholson had a, a largely classical education, but uh, benefited from the changes that Barry had brought into the curriculum uh, by being able to study maths and modern languages. And that proved to be a great advantage uh, when he entered Woolwich. And it also marked him out uh, from most of the other officers uh, who were around at the time. Most of them had gone to the, uh, the larger, uh, more influential public schools and they had received purely classical education. 
but Nicholson's uh, education was much more forward thinking than that. Having said that, he uh, he never forgot his classical training. And according to a chap called Spencer Wilkinson, who was the most prominent uh, military historian of the time and the first professor, a uh, Chicherly professor of uh, military history at Oxford University, he said that uh, Nicholson was always ready with a Latin quote from Ovid to Virgil. He's also interesting because he is a deeply religious man. Uh, and according to Sir Ian Hamilton, he could he knew off by heart Isaiah, Job, Jeremiah, Proverbs, Psalms, Genesis and Exodus. And I think that takes some uh, some doing, uh, given the length of, uh, of some of those uh, books of the Bible. Oh, the only other thing we know about his time at school is that he won the theology prize in his in his final year. We do know that he was an outstanding student. Uh, Barry. Uh, is on record as having tried to persuade him to uh, follow a university career and then go into the law. Uh, but Nicholson, for some reason, was determined on following a path into the military, even though there was no tradition of the military in his family, although his, his, uh, his oldest brother uh, had, uh, had joined the army but had run up into uh, immense debt in doing so and was disinherited by his father. Um, so there's no real military tradition in the family, and nor was there any particular uh, military tradition in the school either. When he left school, Nicholson sat and passed the examinations for entry into the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. And there is no doubt that... Uh, he had been helped by his education at LGS. Unlike many of his fellow applicants, Nicholson had no, uh, no need to go to a crammer, uh, which many of the, the other students had done in order to be able to, uh, to gain a place at Woolwich. But Nicholson still finished in the entrance exam in first place. Uh, while he was uh, at the RMA, he excelled in all areas. He gained a reputation for being the most outstanding cadet, um, but also being somebody who was kind and very compassionate to new cadets as well. Uh, and a chap called uh, Scott Monke Moncrief, uh, who uh, was there uh, a couple of years after Nicholson, says that he was very compassionate towards new snookers, who were the new um, cadets who came into uh, into Woolwich. At the end of his time at Woolwich, he uh, sat and passed his uh, final exams. Again, he was top of the list. He emerged out in first place. He won the, uh, the Pollock Sword and the Pollock Medal, graduated from Woolwich in 1865. And because he was in the top 10, he was allowed to choose whether to go into the Royal Engineers or the Royal Artillery. Uh, and he chose to uh, to go into the Royal Engineers and he gained a commission in the Royal Engineers in 1865. He then spent two years at Chatham, where he completed the course on, uh, on military engineering. And then, and quite interestingly, he was employed by the government to go to the Paris Exhibition in 1867 to write a report for the government on the new German guns being made by the Krupps Company. Uh, and it's interesting they should choose Nicholson, uh, who was an engineer, rather than an artillery officer. Uh, and one can only assume that is because of the clarity of, of his writing and the incisiveness of his mind and he knew what to look for. In March 1868, he then went out to the West Indies, where he served in Barbados uh, and for a time was acting colonial engineer in British Guyana. Uh, and while he was there, he met and he married the lady who was to, to be his wife. Now, she's quite a, a, an interesting character. We don't know a great deal about her for a start. Um, we don't even know, for 100% certain know what her name was. Um, we know that she was Victor, Victoria or Victory Ursula. Um, but many sources have her surname as Dylan and others have her surname as Dallier. 
Uh, there are also discrepancies in records about uh, the year in which they married. Uh, many sources say it was 1869 and others claim it was 1871. All that we do know is that they had a, a very long and supportive marriage. Um, and uh, whilst he died in 1918, she survived him for another, another 20 years. She didn't die uh, until 1938. They were very contrasting characters. Uh, she had a reputation as a very talented sportswoman. Uh, she was an outstanding golfer. Uh, and he followed her all over the country and uh, and also to Europe while she was playing in golf matches. Um, she was a member of the golf club in, in Cannes, uh, as well as being uh, a member of St Andrews uh, and uh, and golf golf clubs in in India as well. She was an excellent rifle shot, uh, and she was also a very good uh, horsewoman. Uh, and owned quite a number of, uh, of trotting horses, um, while Nicholson himself was, uh, as we shall see later on, very uncomfortable even being on horseback at all. Um, it was generally believed at that time that for an officer to, uh, to, to marry so young was, would be very detrimental to his career. Um, that isn't the case as far as uh, as Victoria is concerned. She certainly enhanced Nicholson's career. She gained a reputation as a, a congenial and an amusing hostess. And uh, when they were out in India, she was at, she became known as the Queen Victoria of Simla, Simla being the uh, the main British base in India. And uh, that was something which reached the ears of the royal family, particularly via the Duke of Connaught. Uh, and uh, they were all, even Queen Victoria, said to be very amused uh, by the Queen Victoria of Simla. In 1871, Nicholson, this is a picture of him as a, a young lieutenant. He volunteered for service in India. Uh, and one reason being that an, an officer's salary went a lot further in India. And being from a family of, of relatively modest means, that was a very attractive proposition. His early days in India were spent in the public works department at Hyderabad and then at the military works department at Peshawar. Uh, and he was uh, particularly noted for the construction of a major waterworks scheme. Uh, and that established his reputation as an engineer of some note. Uh, and he became a, a fellow of the, what later became the Smeatonian Society, the Society of Civil Engineers. Smeaton, of course, being another, uh, another old boy of, of Lee's Grammar School. Um, it was one of the most important water and irrigation schemes on the, uh, on the subcontinent. And it was the first one that involved the use of concrete in India. Um, Portland cement was too expensive uh, out there, and so Nicholson had to improvise and to use a lot of local materials. His work on the scheme uh, was widely praised and the system lasted for many years. Um, it established his reputation. It provided him with the opportunity to become familiar with local tribes and with conditions on the Northwest frontier. Having said that, his career remained at that time somewhat unremarkable. His advancement was slow and he was only promoted uh, captain on the 16th of March, 1878. It wasn't until the second Afghan war, uh, which took place between 1878 and 1880, that Nicholson really came to the forefront um, and he got his opportunity for advancement and recognition largely because he became associated with this man, uh, Sir Frederick Roberts, who later became Lord Roberts or, or Bobs, uh, as he became known. Um, he he recognised that uh, Nicholson was showing his ability as an administrative soldier and a brilliant mind, um, and Bobs became his mentor. And increasingly, Roberts came to rely on Nicholson's judgment. Afghanistan, uh, as you will know, was a, a mountainous and quite difficult country and an important buffer in the defence of India from, from Russia. 
the arrival of a Russian delegation in Kabul in 1878 appeared, as far as the governor of India was concerned, to signal a hostile intent. And Lord Lytton, the viceroy of India, demanded that a permanent British mission be established in Afghanistan. The Amir of Afghanistan, Sher Ali, refused, and therefore the British decided on intervention. Nicholson uh, was chosen as one of the, uh, the field engineers and distinguished himself in several engagements, established further his reputation as, a, as a, uh, an engineer officer. And his real chance came with the defence of a, a remote pass known as the Lataban Pass, in December 1879, when uh, he provided the commanding officer with clear, decisive and intelligent support. And uh, he became increasingly recognised as being a very effective staff officer rather, rather than uh, uh, an engineer. Nicholson uh, was appointed as field engineer to Sir Michael Bittle's uh, second division and he performed his task of building roads, securing water supplies, and establishing engineer parks with remarkable swiftness, something which was absolutely vital in, the, uh, in that advance. And uh, he was mentioned in dispatches. In fact, he was mentioned in dispatches altogether throughout his career six times. Bidulf completed his march by the end of April, 1879, and uh, attributed a large part of the success for the rapidity of, the, of the, his advance to Nicholson's energy and ability. Unfortunately, hostilities didn't end, and when the newly established British resident uh, in Kabul, Major Louis Cavagnari, and his men were murdered, uh, Roberts was ordered to form a force and advance on Kabul with Nicholson as field engineer. His experience proved to be invaluable, uh, especially with regard to, to transport. Uh, which Robert stated uh, presented greater difficulties than he had ever experienced in any other campaign. Nicholson's organisation of the defensive lines and the laying of barbed wire entanglements uh, enhanced his reputation so much so that Roberts appointed him to build the permanent defences of Kabul. Uh, and this is a a very little known picture uh, of uh, the engineers in uh, Kabul in 1880, Nicholson is the one on the, uh, I don't know if my cursor will show there, but that is Nicholson with a black hat on, looking uh, quite a fearsome character. Um, and uh, he's there in Kabul building defences for some time um, until... Further danger came when the British army were defeated at the Battle of Maiwand and Roberts had to assemble very quickly a force to march from Kabul to Kandahar. Um, that, that map shows uh, Roberts's advance and he specifically asked for Nicholson as his field engineer. This march from uh, Kabul to Kandahar is probably the most celebrated feat uh, of Victorian warfare. He marched his force of uh, 10,000 men 300 miles in 22 days in the intense heat of the Afghan summer and over very challenging uh, terrain. And again, he credited Nicholson with the speed of the advance, uh, which he said was down to the meticulous preparations and the skill that Nicholson had shown. And uh, Nicholson's then involved in the uh, fighting of the north of the city, where his prior knowledge of the ground proved to be invaluable. Following that, Nicholson uh, left Egypt, uh, left India, sorry, for a very short time in 1881 to serve with uh, Roberts's great rival, Sir Garnet Wolseley, who was the chief, uh, as the chief field, field engineer in the Indian contingent of Wolsey's army. You will probably know of Wolsey from Gilbert and Sullivan because he is uh, the very model of a modern major general. Um, as such, uh, Nicholson then fought at the Battle of Tel Al Kabir uh, and uh, at the important railway junction of Zagazig, he captured four trains which were under steam. 
a difficult, dangerous mission. Uh, and it gave the lie to the accusation which later on uh, arose that Nicholson was purely and simply a death soldier. That's Nicholson's medals. That's a, the collection of Nicholson's medals. Uh, his collection of uh, seven campaign medals compares very favorably with Roberts's six and with Lord Kitchener's seven. And yet many historians still regard Nicholson as purely and simply a death soldier. Those medals were sold last year. I wish I had enough money to buy them. Uh, they actually were auctioned and, and, and were sold for £10,000. They're actually um, not the originals because uh, at some point, and I can't trace exactly when, um, Nicholson's medals were lost uh, in, uh, in the south of France uh, when he was uh, trying to board the ocean line of the Oceana. Uh, and his luggage, including his medals, were lost. And that's a replacement set. But we know he had to apply for that replacement set. <coughs> that um, campaign at Tel Kabir was the, the last occasion on which Nicholson served as a field engineer. After that, he followed almost exclusively in, uh, in staff positions, uh, usually with a large degree of administrative control. He was appointed by Roberts to be uh, the secretary to the newly established Defence Committee at Simla because Roberts said that his uh, understanding of India, of the Indian Army and the administration there was second only to Roberts' own uh, understanding of it. And uh, he, over the next two decades, he acquired an authority and understanding of uh, defence matters through the study and the development of strategic plans, um, which enabled him to stand out from, from the rest. Nicholson was relied on increasingly by Roberts in all sorts of ways, as we shall see later on. Um, he became effectively Roberts's, he was known as Roberts's golden pen, uh, and he wrote uh, many of the speeches and the memoranda that, uh, that Roberts wrote. In 1897, Nicholson was chosen to be chief of staff for William Lockhart's Tirar Expeditionary Force. Nicholson is the uh, in the middle row, second one from the left, the one with the, uh, the very knobbly knees, I think you might say. Um, the Tirar is an extremely remote part of Afghanistan. No British troops had ever penetrated that far into it. Uh, and Lockhart, Lockhart's force was sent there when the Pashtun tribes revolted. Nicholson's knowledge and experience of warfare in the frontier was, frontier was invaluable, and he had considerable influence on the campaign, especially when Lockhart's health deteriorated. It's generally regarded as being the, the most difficult campaign that the British had encountered up to that time uh, in the, in, on the frontier. The terrain, as you can see from the map, is very difficult. It's very mountainous. Uh, many of the British regiments had little or no instruction in hill fighting. And to be fair, part of the difficulty with the campaign was Nicholson himself. Because despite his uh, considerable experience in India and his experience on the frontier, he never seemed to be quite the right man for the role he occupied in the Tira. He was often appeared to be unaware and naive in the field. For example, on one occasion when British and, and Indian troops were being heavily sniped, uh, it's recorded that Nicholson rode to, rode to a viewpoint and sat in full view of the enemy. Uh, Don't be a fool, Nick, get off that pony, yelled Lockhart. Yes, sir, replied Nicholson. A bullet zipped through the helmet of an Indian orderly holding his bridle, while to the amusement of other staff officers, Nicholson slowly dismounted. As chief of staff, Nicholson was also criticised for being too distant from other officers, although his role was particularly difficult, particularly uh, when Lockhart uh, became ill because he was having to do two jobs at the same time. Um, despite all of that and all of the criticism that the campaign received in the press, uh, Lockhart held Nicholson in high regard 
and he was mentioned yet again in dispatches for his part in the campaign. He then went back to India for a very short time, but after the difficult start to the South African War in 1899, we're not allowed to call it the Boer War anymore, it's the South African War, uh, in 1899 and the disasters of so-called Black Week, uh, Roberts was appointed as Commander-in-Chief in South Africa. One of his first tasks was to bring in Nicholson from India as his military secretary because he needed uh, Nicholson's administrative skills. Lord Kitchener was appointed as Roberts's second in command and he and Nicholson very soon clashed. Uh, their personalities just didn't get on, they just didn't get on at all. Um, and it was particularly the case when Roberts made Nicholson the director of transport to work alongside Kitchener. And he did that mainly to sort out the confused state that Kitchener, uh, and effectively the mess that Kitchener had made over the reorganization of the transport system in South Africa. Um, Kitchener had always been known as KFK, Kitchener of Cartoon. Well, he, he then acquired the nickname K of Chaos um, because of the, uh, the chaotic situation that uh, he left the transport in in South Africa. Nicholson said that Kitchener's dispatches and memoranda were puerile. Um, Nicholson himself proved to be a huge success in the role and uh, was very much praised in both the official history and the Times history of the war. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote a uh, history of the South African War, stated that Nicholson never received the credit that he should have received and which Kitchener claimed all for himself. Nicholson then left South Africa when Roberts did in, uh, at the end of 1900, uh, and Roberts became commander in chief of the army at home in, in Britain, and he appointed Nicholson immediately to the new role of Director General of Mobilization and Military Intelligence at the War Office. This is the first time that Nicholson has actually served uh, in England during his, uh, his time in the army. And despite his lack of experience for the role, he was a huge success. And he spent the next 11 years reshaping the War Office and giving it direction. He developed a staff system that would study and develop operational and strategic plans. And basically, he laid the groundwork for the establishment of a general staff. Now, the South African War had shown the deficiencies in the British Army that there were in the British Army. And as a consequence, a Royal Commission, known as the Elgin Commission, uh, was set up to, to investigate those. Part of that uh, was conducted by, by Lord Isha, and Lord Isha was then uh, charged with setting up a committee to reconstruct the War Office uh, in 1904. Isha's committee, which was made up of, of three people, Isha, uh, Jackie Fisher, uh, who uh, became the uh, first Sea Lord, uh, and uh, Sir George Clark. They decided that there needed to be a clean sweep of the war office and that new men were needed to be brought in. And their main target was Nicholson, largely because they believed that Nicholson had become so powerful. He'd, he'd established himself as the most powerful figure in the war office. Um, Fisher and Clark were particularly upset because they uh, believed that Nicholson was opposed to the preeminence of the Navy. The committee decided that a general staff had to be created for the army. And despite the fact that it was Nicholson who put forward the ideas of a general staff uh, along the German model, he was not deemed by the committee to be the right person to bring about the changes. As a consequence, he was dismissed from the war office at a day's notice. Uh, and he was then sent out to be the main British observer with the Japanese army during the Russo-Japanese war. Uh, an experience which he felt was very worthwhile. During his time away, the War Office became somewhat dysfunctional under the leadership of the first chief of the general staff, Sir Neville Littleton, who was actually more interested in cricket than he was in, uh, in leading the War Office. Uh, he spent a lot of his time at Lords. That's Lords, not Lords. Uh, 
something had to be done. And even Isha, who had been responsible for uh, Nicholson's dismissal, uh, began to consider the idea of bringing uh, Nick back. A change of government in 1904, 1905 saw Richard Haldane become Secretary of State for War, and he decided that uh, Nicholson needed to come back, and he, he appointed him to the War Office as Quartermaster General and third member of the Military Council, stating that uh, Nicholson was, quote, a difficult man, still I needed him badly. He also said that when the opportunity occurred, he would make Nicholson uh, chief of the general staff. It was widely acknowledged by now that Nicholson was the only answer to the problem of leadership on the army council. Otherwise, as Haldane said, there is nothing but years of chaos ahead of us. This was a period of, of great reform in the army led by Haldane, who is generally regarded as being the the greatest secretary of state for war that uh, that there was obviously th that role changed later uh, later on um but contrary to the claims of a number of historians nicholson had little part in haldane's army reforms his role seems to have been as a trusted advisor but essentially to bring stability and direction to the war office during that time one of the big debates of the time was the, was the issue of conscription. And Roberts, who uh, by now had left the army, retired from the army, decided to stir up public opinion to support the, uh, the matter of, of conscription. And Nicholson was philosophically in favour of conscription. Uh, and in fact, in 1905, 1906, if you look at the number of letters here and memoranda, he wrote to Roberts, uh, he wrote a considerable number advising Roberts on the details and various models of conscription that might be introduced. But above all, Nicholson, uh, and many people have said this during his time, many of the people who, who, who worked with him, Nicholson was a great pragmatist and he stood aloof from the debates about conscription uh, and he said that politically conscription was unacceptable both to political parties and also to the British public. And of course, conscription wasn't introduced until, uh, until 1916. A key to the understanding of Nicholson himself is his relationship with fellow officers and with politicians. Uh, and it's impossible to, to come to terms and, and get a, an understanding of how Nicholson ticked uh, without uh, understanding those relationships that he had. The late Victorian army essentially centred around two rings of officers. One of those was the Ashanti ring centred around Wolseley, and the other was the Indian ring centred around Roberts. And officers, to some extent, belonged to one or other of the rings, although not exclusively so. Nicholson served with both, uh, although he was clearly uh, part of, of uh, Roberts's ring. And some officers, such as Kitchener, belonged to neither. Promotion and influence at that time depended upon the patronage of a senior officer. Um, Nicholson became a leading member of Roberts's ring. His career can be defined by the opinion of those he came into contact with. Scott Moncrief, who wrote a tribute to Nicholson when Nicholson died, which was in the Engineer's Journal, said of him that he had a great knowledge of character and a power of selecting good men. And he wielded that power with vigor in, and impartiality. Men might fear him, men might dislike him, but all were imbued with the respect that is commanded by capacity, decision and impartiality. He then wants to say that Nicholson had a very clear perception of what the ultimate aim was and the relative importance of every subject and they expressed his views with a remarkable skill and strength. And it's that strength which actually brought him into, into contact and conflict uh, with many of his, uh, his peers in the army. Many officers, as we've seen, uh, had the highest respect for him. Uh, Lord Roberts was the first to recognise his abilities and uh, he became one of Roberts's protégés, although very quickly he became his own man. Uh, 
he relied on Roberts for his initial promotions. Roberts relied on Nicholson for his engineering skills, his administrative abilities, and his attention to details. Roberts, and Roberts for a time, decided to write a book on the Peninsula War, uh, and he basically he didn't write it. Nicholson wrote it for him. Um, and uh, he went into great detail reading uh, Wellington's dispatches in order to be able to, to do that. He uh, wrote most of uh, many of Roberts's memoranda, many of his speeches, and Roberts's most famous book, 41 Years in India, was again effectively written by Nicholson. Uh, and most of that can be seen in the letters between the two, which are in the National Army Museum. A second commander who relied heavily on Nicholson was Sir William Lockhart, as we've seen in the Tirar. Uh, Lockhart had the, the highest opinion of Nicholson. He trusted his sound judgment. He trusted his clear gasp of, grasp of affairs. And as we've seen, that was particularly important when Lockhart fell ill during the campaign in the Tirar and had to rely on Nicholson to lead affairs. Not all soldiers got on so well with him, though. Um, but what is interesting is that the ill feeling tended to be on their part rather than on Nicholson's. He, if he makes any criticisms of people, uh, it's not a personal criticism. It's a criticism of their professional performance, whereas uh, the ill will on the part of other officers to him uh, often, often is more personal. Nicholson has seemed to have the ability to view matters somewhat dispassionately and professionally, uh, and as we said, seldom resorted to personal comments. Uh, as I've already mentioned, he and Kitchener did not get on at all well. And the origins of that stem from their time in South Africa when Kitchener took all the credit for Nicholson's reorganization of the transport system. Nicholson didn't believe that Kitchener was particularly competent, despite the fact that the British public saw Kitchener as a great heroic figure uh, he said he lacked administrative ability, and he's not alone in his assessment of Kitchener. The Hungarian ambassador Cairo had said of Kitchener, of Kitchener that he was one of the most unpopular generals in the British army who exploited everyone. Kit Churchill, who became a, a great friend of Nicholson's, said of Kitchener that he was a thoroughly bad tactician, ill-mannered, utterly callous and probably equally unscrupulous. Lady Curzon, the wife of the Viceroy of India, had no time for Kitchener and said that all of India would rejoice when Kitchener left. On his part, uh, Kitchener continued to be quite resentful of Nicholson, especially in, uh, in 1912 when Nicholson was appointed to chair a commission investigating the expenditure of the Indian army with a review to reversing some of the reforms of the Indian Army that Kitchener had introduced while he'd been commander in chief in India. Kitchener's resentment continued even as late as 1914, uh, when Sir Charles Douglas, by this time Nicholson had retired, but Sir Charles Douglas, who was then the CIGS, died from overwork. And a number of people had suggested that Nicholson might be reappointed uh, as CIGS. Kitchener, who was then Secretary of State for War, blocked that return, uh, despite the, uh, the clamour of some politicians for Nicholson to, uh, to, to come back into the post. He also clashed vigorously with Sir John Fisher, uh, or Jackie Fisher, as he's often known, who was a, uh, a very strong, eccentric personality. Uh, there's a clear clash of interests. They are both heads of their parts of the service. Uh, they both of them want to protect their own branch of the service. Uh, and Fisher wanted to preserve the primacy of the Navy, in particular with regard to the amount of money given to the services, uh, that known as the, the, the estimates, the Navy estimates, particularly because he wanted to ensure that the British fleet was there to defend Britain. Uh, and this is the time of the... Uh, of the building of the dreadnoughts and the, and the naval race. Uh, Nicholson believed that the army was underfunded and that the army would be needed both for home defence and, and overseas as well. Both men were single-minded. 
Both were determined and both were immensely forceful. Fisher was concerned that Nicholson was becoming too powerful and he's part of that Isha committee, which had ousted Nicholson from office in 1904. The difference is that Fisher often resorted to personal insults against Nicholson. He called him old Nick. He called him Beelzebub. He said that he was hairy about the hocks, uh, whatever that means. Um, In 1911, uh, when uh, Nicholson was getting the better of the uh, debate against the army during concerns over the Agadir incident, he asked Haldane if he would enjoy old Nick not always to stamp his foot on his, that's Fisher's, uh, his hoof, sorry, on his Fisher's foot. Nicholson had a sharp tongue, uh, was exceptionally intelligent, and he regularly got the better of their disagreements. The difficulty in the long term uh, for both the army and the navy is that, and for the defence of Britain, was that their disagreements often presented the defence committee from acting effectively. Two officers who had been close to Nicholson changed their view of him. Uh, Henry Wilson, who was a protégé of Nicholson's, became frustrated with him. It needs to be acknowledged that that Wilson himself was a difficult character who expressed frustration with anybody who didn't agree with him or who he felt acted too slowly. Wilson had declared that if a general staff were ever to be founded, it would be due entirely to Nicholson. And then later on Nicholson's retirement in 1912, he made the sweeping statement, I doubt if in the whole of the time he's been CIGS, he has done a single thing to prepare the army for war. That latter expression was was due to the fact that he'd begun to view Nicholson as being too cautious and not willing to give his full support to Wilson's with France scheme. Um, Nicholson believing that it, it, gave Britain only one course of action and particularly committed them to one country that is supporting France. Perhaps the most interesting of your relationships, though, is is with Sir Ian Hamilton, who became uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Gallipoli Expedition. Nicholson and and Hamilton had long been friends since their early days in India. and They'd shared a house together. Their break in relationship started when Nicholson was appointed as the chief British observer to the Japanese army during the Russo-Japanese War. He had a a short time earlier suggested that Hamilton uh, should go to Manchuria with the expectation of having that appointment for himself. When Nicholson was dismissed from the war office, he was appointed to that post and Hamilton's wife, Jean Hamilton, blame Nicholson for the fact that he, and not Hamilton, became the senior British observer, even though it wasn't of Nicholson's doing. And it appears that she fueled Hamilton's growing disenchantment with Nicholson. If you read her diaries, she's quite vitriolic uh, about uh, Nicholson. Even when he died, uh, she was complaining that why didn't he die a few years earlier to save my husband from all the hassle he's given him over the over Gallipoli? Um, she's quite an invidious character, is Jean Hamilton, who raised anyone who did not show obsequious sycophancy to her beloved Johnny. And that included even those who'd been close supporters of her husband, such as Kitchener. When the Dardanelles Commission uh, was appointed in 1917 to investigate the failures of the campaign, which Hamilton had led, uh, Nicholson was appointed to be the military member. Hamilton said, uh, Nicholson's appointment caused me to shudder. On the surface, he's always been a friend, but his delight in mischief making will certainly find scope in the commission. He's been jealous of me and is always trying to put a spoke in my wheel. In fact, Nicholson's uh, attitude, behaviour and his judgments from the commission were very even handed. uh, And Nicholson was always impressed by Hamilton's abilities. And it appears, again, that the the animosity was uh, was one sided, largely fueled by Hamilton's wife. And that Nicholson remained 
unaware of Hamilton's feelings. And when Gene Hamilton had died, Ian wrote, Ian wrote his book, uh, Listening for the Drums, he gave every appearance of having a more positive attitude towards Nicholson. Politicians regarded Nick, in general, regarded Nicholson highly, and they relied on his experience and ability. Uh, Lord Isha, who we've seen was responsible for, for dismissing him uh, in 1904, um, decided that uh, actually he'd made a mistake about that. He changed his mind and he wrote at the end of 1904 very favourably about the quality of Nicholson's dispatches from, uh, from Japan, stating um, that those dispatches were full of incisive and critical facts, whereas Hamilton's dispatches were superficial and full of opinion rather than facts. Later on, when, Ham when Nicholson was, uh, was chief of the general staff, he stated that he is certainly an underrated man. No one will ever know what a great, a large debt of gratitude is due to him for his hard work, patience and good sense in administering the army. So Richard Haldane, later Lord Haldane, held Nicholson in great high regard and they became very friendly. Um, and as we've seen, he brought him back to the War Office in 1906. Needing Nicholson to bring stability to the War Office, given the dysfunctionality of the, uh, the Littleton era, with a view to uh, replacing Little, uh, Littleton in due course. Churchill had met uh, Nicholson in the Tirar in 1897, and they became great friends. And despite uh, the criticism in general of, of Churchill <coughs> uh, during, the, um, during the Gallipoli uh, Commission, the Dardanelles Commission, they remained very friendly uh, until Nicholson died and they sat together on the Defence Committee. Perhaps the main reason why Nicholson was appreciated by politicians was that he showed no favour to any political party and he rose above politics to give an impartial view on any matter. Politicians tended res to respect his views and opinions and they respected the fact that ultimately he was a pragmatist. There was no doubt, though, that he could be a difficult character. At one stage, uh, he was uh, told by the king that he had to uh, make a formal apology to the Duke of Connaught for his behaviour towards him at the Army Selection Board. Uh, but again, the king came to recognise Nicholson's abilities and promoted him to be uh, chief of the general staff and one of his aide-de-camps. Nicholson in 1908 succeeded Littleton as CGS, a role uh, which, as I said, became chief of the Imperial General Staff the following year. He was, of course, an administrator, and therefore it was agreed that he would not lead the army uh, if a war ever came about. Nicholson is th essentially established the general staff as being the thinking branch of the army, and he gave the, uh, the general staff its organisation. He prepared the mobilisation arrangements of the expeditionary force which were in 1914 to prove of such value. He worked out for the use of future administrations, a scheme for the reorganization of the army on a national basis. And he welded together the various personal elements of the general staff who supported their chief admirably. He established the fact that an expeditionary force would be maintained for an overseas purpose and a territorial force for home defense. In short, Nicholson devised strategic plans and shaped the British Army that entered the First World War. <coughs> he was promoted to the rank of Field Marshal in 1911 and retired in 1912. Haldane left the, uh, the War Office at the same time. Um, Nicholson was elevated to the peerage as Baron Nicholson of Roundhay, um, and the Times military correspondent, Reppington, reported the following year that the efficiency of the War Office had declined by 50% uh, since Haldane and Nicholson had left it. 
He, uh, Nicholson, continued to serve as a member of the Committee of Imperial Defence, went back to India to look into the expenditure of the Indian Army and was then uh, on the Dardanelles Commission. And uh, he also became in charge of the Territorial Army uh, in London during the course of the, the First World War. He died at home uh, at, uh, on the 13th of September, 1918. His home was at 51 Pont Street. As you can see, they are rather splendid buildings. They're actually just behind Harrods. If you go to Harrods, they're just around the back. His funeral took place at uh, Brompton Parish Church, followed by a burial at Brompton Cemetery. On his death, uh, the peerage became extinct because he and uh, Victoria never had any children. Spencer Wilkinson remarked that Nicholson cared nothing for the pomp and show of military tradition. His last wish was that he was uh, laid to rest in his grave without the display or ceremony usually associated with his high rank. I tried to include it in the, in the, in the PowerPoint, but I couldn't. But if you go onto YouTube, there is a, uh, and put in Field Marshal Lord Nicholson's funeral, uh, there is a 34 second film clip uh, of his funeral there. His headstone is very unprepossessing. It's very unassuming. Uh, that's his, his headstone in, in Brompton Cemetery. It's just a shield laid flat on the floor. You have to search hard to try and find it. Um, his ability, though, was not confined purely and simply to his work on the army. He speculated on the stock market and he advised others on, uh, on uh, which shares to, uh, to invest in. And on his death, he had accumulated a wealth that amounts in today's terms to about nine million pounds. Um, his wife, I have to say, during the next 28, 20 years, spent the vast majority of that uh, living uh, a very um, social life down in Cannes. Uh, and then she became a permanent uh, resident at uh, St. James's Hotel in London. There's no national memorial to, to Nicholson. He's not even really recognised or known in his home city. The only acknowledgement is this plaque, which I uh, was instrumental in having erected on the former LGS building in Moreland Road in, in 2019. I'd hoped to get it in 2018, which was the uh, anniversary of his death, but with various problems with the foundry, it didn't happen until 2019. So to sum up uh, about Nicholson, he is a highly intelligent man who, despite his many achievements, remains largely unknown. He rose to the highest rank in the army, despite the fact he never commanded a unit. He never graduated from the staff college, and yet he rose to become chief of the Imperial General Staff. And despite the lack of patronage, he became a peer of the realm. As a consequence, he's one of the most remarkable soldiers of his era, largely because he excelled in positions of administrative work rather than in the field. And all of that was achieved through ability and hard work. He used to get up at three in the morning uh, to start work, uh, worked right through to breakfast, uh, and then spent the rest of the day in, uh, that's on his paperwork, spent the rest of the day in his meetings uh, and various other things. He's a very private man. Uh, there are no documents or books in his name, despite the fact he was a, a very gifted and, and brilliant uh, uh, writer. He rarely spoke in public, although he was a, a brilliant, uh, witty and humorous speaker. Uh, Scott Moncrief, uh, who wrote that tribute to him, said that in the early days, he was an intensely amusing comrade, full of humour and unexpected jokes, but he was apparently quite indifferent to the opinion of his brother officers. And that, given the fact that he could be stubborn and outspoken, would explain why a number of his fellow officers found him to be a difficult person. There are a number of, of recorded incidents of his sense of humour, uh, following the uh, Egyptian campaign in 1882, Nicholson discovered that amongst the list of those recommended for promotion was a Captain Armstrong, uh, who, although had been originally on the list of officers to go, 
to Egypt had never actually taken part in the campaign due to a reduction of the numbers of those who were sent there. Now, for the War Office, that's an inexcusable blunder. And Nicholson seized upon the opportunity. Um, he'd actually received that promotion himself to that rank two years earlier. But due to his liking for a practical joke, he applied for the promotion, claiming that it was a clerical error and it was actually meant to be for him. The application was refused, so Nicholson appealed directly to the Queen under Section 24 of the Army Act. Uh, Scott Moncrief says that the flutter caused in the War Office by his audacious act was exactly what he wanted. Uh, whenever he was asked about the, the success of his appeal, he would reply with a great deal of laughter that the highest authorities in the War Office were very peevish. Uh, despite being a deeply religious man with a phenomenal memory, as, as I've said, um, we're also told that he was a great expert on growing begonias, which seems quite an interesting occupation for a, an army officer. On one occasion, when the king visited Aldershot and Nicholson as uh, CIGS uh, accompanied him, the king took them on a long, a long horse ride. Nicholson was never comfortable on horseback, and at lunch, the king good-naturedly made fun of him. Nicholson used to quote in scripture, took it in good part, and answered, Thank you, sir, but I trust that I bear my trials with appropriate patience, for I know that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Um, there is no doubt that his reputation has suffered because some historians have simply accepted the views of uh, a few notorious critics. He's rarely received the credit to which he's due. Early historians of British strategic policy were not able to reach a consensus about Nicholson's importance to the administration of British defence prior to World War I. Aviation enthusiasts regard, regarded Nicholson's caution about the introduction of aeroplanes as, as opposition, but the truth actually couldn't be further from, uh, couldn't be more different. Nicholson was cautious because he wanted to employ all the options. He was also guarding about committing much needed financial resources until he was clear about the advantages. And then he committed himself completely. His attitude towards the Admiralty was never as simplist simplistically antagonistic as Fisher had observers believe. Since he never wrote an autobiography or handed down a set of papers, Nicholson is at a disadvantage and the historical narrative has been dominated by the criticisms of his more famous colleagues. At the same time, Nicholson himself was un uninterested in acclaim. He always gave credit and praise to his subordinates where it was due. And he was, in, despite his prominence, in many ways, an unassuming figure. Just one final story. Spencer Wilkinson recalled that Nicholson had told him a story with great delight. He had to... And Spencer Wilkins said he, that's Nicholson, had to go down, I think, to Salisbury to look at a cavalry barracks and was met at the station by the commanding officer and adjutant who'd been out with their regiment in the rain and were wet through. He told them to go home and change as he could do the business without help. After he finished his inquiries, he went for lunch to the regimental mess where he was treated as a distinguished guest but was puzzled by the constant polite references made by the officers to the French army in the course of the conversation. So he asked the question, who do you suppose me to be? And the answer was, we know who you are, General Foch. I thought you were mistaken, he said. I'm not General Foch. Who are you then? The chief of the general staff. Great consternation. And after lunch, as General Nicholson left for his train, the senior staff officer expressed the hope that their careers would not suffer from their error. Nicholson excelled throughout his career in positions of administrative control. He instigated a great deal, a great development in staff work and was central to war office planning between 1901 and 1912. His work shaped the British Army prior to World War I. Indeed, it's impossible to fully understand the reorganisation of the British Army or the development of British strategy without studying Nicholson's career. He was, and I'll just finish with this, he was undoubtedly 
one of the most remarkable generals of the late Victorian and Edwardian army. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that very interesting wide ranging talk, which we hope will establish Nicholson's reputation, which he so far, as you say, hasn't really fully deserved. We have about 10 minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask it. While people are thinking of their question, John, can I put in a question? Do you, By think, all means. Do you think he suffered because he was an intelligent grammar school boy rather than more traditionally from um, more higher social standing public school? I'm, I'm absolutely certain that there is an element of that. Um, he was regarded as being quite unusual because he came from a Northern Day grammar school, which although was regarded as a public school, was very much uh, looked down upon by, uh, by senior officers who had gone to the more traditional public schools. And there are some very interesting books about uh, the army and about social standing at that time. And, and they all make it clear that a, a, you know, traditionally a, class, a purely classical education was regarded as being the, the epitome of what the army officer needed to have. And Nicholson had had more than that. Uh, and the grammar school, and particularly Barry, had provided him with that, uh, that difference. Thank you. Do we have anyone?